Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you gather us to realize what it is that you sent to us through the three angels. We are praying that now you may impress us with your spirit, that we may preach your message with honest simplicity, yet with a lot of clarity, that this message is being preached again may not be masked with sophistries, but rather, Lord, in their simplicities, not seeking to introduce anything new that is not really new, but just to teach what is in your word with clarity. We may be awakened to make decisions to follow you. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, to do something really detailed today, but I'm seeking to make the third angel's message again simple for us, as we've done in the first and the second angel's message. I, I have been having a uh, just a second. I've been having uh, 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 some studies that uh, uh, I've been doing on, on that. And I'm just thinking that in studying this, we might be uh, blessed to see what it is that the Lord is saying to us. And so I'll just try to share the screen because we want to begin reading and see what it is that the Lord is saying to us. Let me see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I hope you are able to see uh, my screen. And I'll just be reading a couple of verses. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter number 14. As I was reading from. And we'll be starting from chapter number 14. And I'm reading from verses number 9. Revelation 14 from verse number 9. Okay, so 14 from verse number 9. Last time we were able to read from verse number 8. Now let's begin from verse number 9. See what the Lord is saying to us. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Do not forget, the first angel also had a loud voice. And I've mentioned before, while we are studying the first angel's message, that it was in a loud voice. And we mentioned that's a couple of angels in the book of Revelation. By the way, the book of Revelation is filled with a lot of truth about the ministration of angels. And we were able to see that not all the angels in the book of Revelation have a loud voice, but at least we are appreciating that the first angel and the second angel, they have a loud voice. But that's not it. We were also able to see in chapter 10 that the angel there was flying in the midst of heaven, also had an uh, astounding loud voice. And chapter 18, we have an angel with a loud voice. And it was saying with a loud voice, if, and that's a conditional statement, if any man worship the beast, Michael's words, worship the beast, uh, it's not just a beast. There's a reason why the spirit, uh, uh, the Bible refers to it as the beast, because of the reason that we are very sure about the beast identified in this chapter, the beast and his image. That's interesting. So if any man worship the beast and his image, so there is the worshiping of the beast and his image, and there is the receiving of the mark in his forehead or in his hand. What shall happen to that person? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. We'll be able to find out quite a couple of things. What does it mean when the Bible says that that person shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of God's indignation? And he shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of holy angels and of the pres in the presence of the Lamb. At least now, by the time we are almost completing the reading of the three angels' messages, you've seen the Father, you've seen the Lamb, and you've seen only angels. 
When we go to heaven, we are going to spend some good time with the Father, with the Son, and with all the angels. The next level of people that will be there will be saved humanity. There is no other being in heaven. And there will be no other being in heaven then, apart from the three classes I've mentioned. The Father, the Son, only angels, and saved humanity. Of course, we know that there are representatives from other fallen worlds that will be making their inroads into heaven and also because they have been appearing before God every now and again. But in this case, we are not referring to them. We are referring to the redeemed people who are from the earth. And then it says in verse 11, and the smoke of the torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. And then the Bible ends that message, says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So what's happening in the third angel's message, I want to mention from the very beginning, the third angel's message is the most solemn warning ever given to human beings. There is no any other warning ever given since the beginning of the world in the old scripture as scary as this warning. This message actually entails a lot more than just what we can see. And if we just read it in its simplicity, we might be awakened to see certain portions of it that have been left unmentioned and yet are very important. The third angel's message starts in verse 9, and it says, And the angel, which is the third one, followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man fear, or if anyone worship the beast and his image, pause a little bit. We all, in studying the truth about the three angels' messages, have realized that actually the first angel was with a loud voice for the first angel was actually preaching the gospel. And we realize that the third angel's message is not the gospel if the first angel's message is divorced from it. Now, many people have always clung to the fact that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. The question that begs to be answered is how is the third angel's message in verity? How is it? The third angel's message on the surface appears only to be a warning message, which is what it is. And the spirit of prophecy agrees, and the Bible agrees, it is a warning message. However, what makes it the gospel that Sister White says that the third angel's message, righteousness by faith, is the third angel's message in verity? It is simply because you can never preach the third angel's message except you preach the first angel's message, which includes give glory to God and fearing God, and worshiping the only true God. And so any man who does not understand the first angel's message cannot claim that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. The third angel's message is a warning. And why is it a warning? Because there has already been a first angel's message preached and is to be repeated. There has to be a re-preaching of the first angel's message. And the second angel's message is a separation message it is a message that separates the true people of God from apostate Protestantism, which is the Babylon referred to in Revelation chapter 14. But they are also called daughters of Babylon, according to Revelation chapter 17. And so what happens is when the third angel is coming, the third angel is saying, if any man receive or worship the beast, we need to ask ourselves, how do you worship the beast and his image? So then it means that you can never understand the third angel's message without understanding Revelation chapter 13. Because chapter 13 will give us a few more details about the third angel's message. Only those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark receive the wine of the wrath of God poured upon them or out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14 or rather chapter 13 and see what <laughs> constitutes worshiping the beast. Now when you go to chapter 13 and we are reading from verses number 11. And I beheld another beast. Remember it's not referred to as the beast. It's another beast. 
The first piece of Revelation chapter 13 is constantly referred to with the article, uh, what I would call the determinant uh, article there. And what happens is it's very easy to differentiate it from the beast that is rising from or out of the earth. And this beast had two horns and they were lamb-like. He was lamb-like. And he spake as a dragon. Now you'll be able to realize why the spirit of prophecy, rather, why the Bible says he spake as a dragon. Now we've realized that the dragon could refer to Satan, but we've also realized that the dragon could somehow refer to the imperial Rome or the pagan Rome. Now, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. So all the powers of the first beast, which is Roman, the purple Rome, is exercised by this second beast. And he causes, this second beast causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Remember we said, if any man worship the beast, how then do we worship the beast? If any man worship the beast, how do we worship the beast? The world will need to understand how they shall worship the beast. How the whole world will be brought into the worship of the beast, they must understand if they are to understand the solemn warning of Revelation 14 from 1 9 to verses 12. Clearly, the Bible tells us that the second beast causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Now, just listen a little bit. If you pause there and go to Revelation chapter 13, Go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse number three. And I saw one of his heads, the first beast, as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. How did all the world wander after the beast? Because the Bible says, I saw one of his head as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. That is something in the future. So is that something that is going to happen? I saw, so John is seeing it coming in the future, a time when this beast will be wounded and his head or the wound in his head shall be healed. And then the Bible says, and the whole world shall wander after the beast. So what does the Bible mean when it says the whole world shall wander after the beast? And it also says in verses number 12 that he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So you can actually pause a little bit there and run with me to, I think, uh, John. Just go to John chapter numbers, John chapter number 17. In John chapter number 17, in verse 14, the Bible says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world. What makes them be not of the world? It's because they have the word. So if you have the word of God, you are not of the world. But then the Bible says, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Why was Christ not of the world? Because Christ had the word of God. He accepted the word of God as truth. So all the world is wandering after the beast, reason being the whole world does not accept the word of God as a ruling creed in their life. Except uh, uh, on the other side, they are accepting creeds. They are accepting the teachings of man. They are accepting the doctrines of men as the sure commandments of God. And for that reason, they are wandering after the beast. So if you have the word of God, you're not of the world. But if you are of the world, you don't have the word of God. So really what we need to look at here, which is the defining factor of who belongs to the world, is the word of God. If the word of God is in you, if my word abide in you, look at what the Bible now says in chapter 15 of the book of John. The Bible says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me, 
and are in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine and no more can ye except you abide in me but then it says in verses number seven if ye abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask whatsoever you will and it shall be done unto you so the word of god must abide in someone in order that that person may not be of the world so when the Bible speaks a language as such as all the world shall wander after the beast, in a general sense, the Bible is referring to the whole world, in a specific sense, it's referring to all who reject the word of God. And so what happens in chapter number 13, where we are now explaining how they will worship the beast, is that the whole earth, or they that dwell on earth, refers to those who, in a way, will not regard or accept the word of God as the ruling script in their lives. So what happens here, it says uh, in verses number 13, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we can see the second beast is what will cause you to worship or cause the world to worship the first beast. The Bible says, if any man worship the beast and his image. So for this beast to have its image, we know that the beast refers to a one pure church. That actually what happens is that pure church had to be corrupted to become what is called purple Rome. So for it, for the second beast to form an image, then we must have Protestantism, a once pure church, being corrupted to become a posted Protestantism and clasping the hands of the government or forming a union with the government or the politics of that nation so that it becomes the image to the beast. And so it says, <clears throat> it uh, it says, exercise all the power of him, the beast that was before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, that's Papa Rome, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. What does it mean in the sight of the beast? They are as though they were contemporaries. They are actually existing almost at some same period of time. There are times that they exist side by side, these two beasts. And so what happens, that is why it's doing the miracles in the sight of the beast of the papacy, in the time during which papacy exists saying to them that dwell on the earth and they that should make um that they should make an image to the beast so it's saying to those who are dwelling in the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live so it's exhorting the world it's exhorting those who are obedient to it it's subjects to make an image to the beast and what does it mean to make an image to the beast it means a posted Protestantism has to actually come from being Protestant and doing the same thing that Papa C did or the same thing that Catholicism did in actually uh, clasping its hands with Paganism and forming what is called Papas. They have to do the same thing in actually clasping the hands of the government and also in dropping out the truths of the bible that made them a distinctive protestant people and so what happens in verse 15 it says and he had the power to give life to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast that they should be killed now there is a killing in revelation chapter number 14 13 verses number 15. there is also a what I would say, the wrath of God falling upon those who accept. So either side, there is some sort of persecution, except one is a torment that cannot be quenched. On the other side, we are going to see an intervening hand of God upon his people. For example, what I mean is 
with the beast, those who worship the beast and his image and accept the mark on their right hand or on their forehead, they shall receive of the wine of the wrath of God. Those who on the other hand reject the beast, the worship of the beast and his image, and receive not his mark in their right hand or in their forehead, they are also going to be persecuted. And that's what the Bible says, that they should be killed. And the Bible says that this beast, the second beast in Revelation 13, he, can, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. And then it says that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and here is wisdom. Let him that hath the understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. And so when you continue to verse chapter number 14, that is where now you find the three angels' messages, and we go back to where we are. And it says in verses number nine, that the third angel was saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receives the mark in his forehead or in his arm, we've realized in order to worship the beast, we must have the second beast, which is the beast coming up of the earth, which is apostate Protestantism or uh, those who had actually left the truth, the Protestant, who left Europe, came into America as the earth, saving the woman, settled there, and were protesting against the falsehood of Catholicism, now dropping their bars and beginning to clasp hands with papacy in terms of what they believe. The Bible says, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark on his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wrath, wine of the wrath of God. We've realized it is only possible to do worship the beast through the deceptions that will be, uh, will be brought in by the apostate protestantism. Now, you need to understand something really clear that the Bible says in chapter 6, and go with me of the book of Revelation and see verses number 12. It says in verse number 12 and 13, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east should be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the Lord God Almighty. And so we are already seeing that here there is a reference to the false prophet. Of which thing we know the dragon has been mentioned, as it is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. And we know the dragon exists also in chapter number 13. We are also seeing uh, the beast, the beast, and you need to look at that article there, beast, so that refers to the prophecy and then out of the mouth of the false prophet. It goes without saying that most probably the false prophet is the same as the, the beast that we are shown to be coming up out of the earth. Because we're already seeing the dragon according to chapter 12. We are seeing the beast, which is the first beast that refers to the papacy. And now here we are seeing the false prophet While in verses number 13, which is lamb-like, and he's speaking as a dragon. So 
we are seeing the very attributes of the dragon and the attributes of the beast inside of this beast that is actually speaking as a dragon, yet appearing as a lamb, because of the constitutional structure that was there at the very forming stages, infant stages of America. Now, what happens is, for the, the spirits of devils, they are working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the old world and gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. We asked ourselves the simple question, how is it that um, the beast, that the second beast of Revelation 13 shall cause the old world to wander after the first beast? We are already being told that it's through what is called the spirits of devils working miracles. So it's through the falsehood of miracles. I would say it's through spirits of devils and miracles. And these miracles are worked by the spirits of the devils to the extent that we can say it is through spiritualism that the world will be caused to worship the beast. So we're just trying to narrow that down. It's through spiritualism that the world will be caused to worship the beast. What is spiritualism? Spiritualism is actually going against or rejecting the plainest statements of God. For example, God says to Adam and Eve, in the day that thou eat of this fruit, thou shalt surely die. Then the devil comes and says, you shall not surely die, is actually going against the plainest statements of the scripture. And we are going to see that the third angel's message, which has been preached of God, for by many of us in our revelation seminars, in our teachings of the three angels' messages, we ought to see how many will be caused to worship the beast and to receive the mark in their forehead. It will be through spiritualism. And we'll spend time, if the Lord will allow us, to understand what constitutes spiritualism. There are spirits of the devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and unto the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the Lord. Is it true that spirits of demons are actually going on through the whole world, gathering people through miracles and falsehoods and deceptions? Yes. That is happening all over the world right now. The spirits of demons, working miracles, are going forth to kings of the earth and to the old world, and they're doing what is called a gathering work. They are gathering their clients. But we also know that on the other side, God is also gathering his people, gathering his people to be able to stand with his son when he stands, stands when Michael stands. And that's very important. And so we've realized that, yes, it's the second beast that caused the world to worship the first beast. But how, again, we've realized it's through the spirits of the devil working miracles that... Actually, uh, objects, a great day of the Lord. Revelation chapter 19, verses 20, if you read, this is what the Bible says. And the beast was taken. We all know, I will begin reading from uh, verse number 19. And I saw the beast, and we know that refers to purpose, which is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the oars and against his army. And we know that's huge because this is actually showing us the final event, the destiny of this beast. And we can see it's almost coming to its end. And what's happening is, I saw the beast, that is papacy, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. So here we are referring to more than just the nation of America, because it's not the nation of America taken and then dumped into the fire. I, I am trying to assume that we all understand that the second beast refers to the Republic of America. But then I am just trying to help us understand deeply what this refers to. So it's not the nation itself 
taken and dumped into the lake of fire, according to what I understand. But what is referred to are the people, the protestants that once were protesting, but have ceased to protest, and then were foremost in stretching their hands over the gulf to take hold of spiritualism. And having taken hold of spiritualism, rejecting their own country's constitution that gave freedom and liberty of conscience, of, mean, of worship, and then taking hold of the government to be able to uh, infringe the rights of God's people so that they can be able to form an image to the beast by instituting what is called the Sunday worship. They are referred to as false prophets. And we can see this in the actually in uh, in the experience in the history of the Israelites. And we'll be able to look at what constitutes a false prophet. And the Bible says, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. So the false prophet was doing miracles before him, just like we saw in chapter 13, that actually America or the second beast, a lamb-like beast, was also doing miracles in the sight of the first beast. So let's continue seeing that beautiful connection in the book of Revelation, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So we can be able to see that the beast and the prophet, which is a false prophet, are both having their destiny in the lake of fire. Now, the second beast that we are referring to, apostate Protestantism, which is the image of the beast, we have already seen in clear terms, was lamb-like, just like we saw Catholicism begin as a pure church of God. And what happens, it became papacy when it accepted pagan doctrines into the church and then gave up the pure Christian doctrines and then tapped into the favor of the government. And that's the same thing that happens with Protestants that actually ended America in the early 1800s. These beautiful churches that defended the truth of God at one point gives up the doctrines that once made them a peculiar people, and then they tap into the creeds of the world and make them their defining teachings, and then those who descend from their teachings are kicked out because they no longer believe in the freedom of expressing their biblical beliefs they stand on the platform of their creeds. And then what happens, they tap into the government to help them enforce their creeds, which then makes them follow the very example of purpose. And any denomination or movement or church that follows those footsteps must have its destiny in the lake of fire burning with brands. And then the Bible says in verse 21, and the remnant was slain. The remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceed out of his mouth? And all the falls were filled with the flesh. Listen to that again. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the ox, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the foals were filled with their flesh. The judgment spoken of in the third angel's message proceeds from God. I will come to that point, but mark those words. They are not a judgment that comes as a result of divine recession. God himself takes responsibility through his son, Jesus Christ, to punish those who are rejectors of his truth at the end of the world's history. It is very important that spiritualism will rob some of us of the plainest statements of the scripture 
and will begin teaching doctrines such as God does not destroy. When the third angel's message is very plain that God himself will pour out his wrath, the wine of his wrath. And you can be able to see that it's through miracles, spirits of demons, spiritualism, that actually causes thousands to drift from the platform of truth. The third angel's message is a warning if any man receive worship the beast or its image and receive their mark, then they have their portion in the lake of fire. The Bible is clear to us in regard to who constitutes the false prophet that we've read in chapter number 19, verse 20. And I'll read for us. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, go with me to Deuteronomy, Chapter number 13, chapter number 13. And if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, that's akin to a spiritualist. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Wherefore he spake unto this saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Follow me carefully. This prophet has called people to go after other gods which we have not known. Why have they not known those gods? Because the Israelites heard the voice of God say, I am the Lord thy God that brought me out of the land of all bondage, out of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before. Let us go after other gods, says this prophet. This prophet is a dream of dreams or a dream of dreams, and he giveth a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder comes to pass. Question. Does the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 have miracles that come to pass? Yes. Unlike in the time of Elijah, when fire refused to come from heaven for false prophets, this time fire comes literally from heaven. And we are able to see also in Revelation chapter 13 that this is a false prophet and this prophet is dreaming or this dreamer or I mean, or this dreamer has a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dream of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth thee to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then he says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death. Why is he being put to death? Because it's a false prophet. Reason being, he has diverted the attention of God's people from worshiping the true God. Because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. It's a false prophet which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. And then he says to thrust thee out of the way with the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So thou, uh, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy mother, or thy daughter, or thy wife, or thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, and ties this secret, he saying, let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou know thy fathers, namely, of the gods, of the people which are around about you, nigh unto thee, or are far off from thee, from the end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto them, nor hearken unto them, neither shalt thine eyes pity them, pity them, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be fast upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. Thou shalt stone him with stones that he die. 
because he had sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. If thou shalt hear, say in one of thy cities which the Lord thy God hath given to thee to dwell therein, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have, you have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make such and ask how diligently. And behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof, with the edge of the sword. Then thou shalt gather all the spoil of it in the midst of the street thereof, and shall burn it with found the city. And so what you can be able to see is the false prophet, we are being shown, if we go back to what we are reading, what constitutes a false prophet, is that this false prophet was actually in the time of the Israelites uh, teaching people to actually go after other gods which they had not known. And you realized also that the false prophet is also working miracles. Just the same way we also saw the false prophet in chapter number 19 um, working miracles in the book of Revelation. And in chapter number 13, it's working miracles. It's the same prophet in chapter number 17, uh, 19, 16, and 14 and the same prophet in chapter number 13 that is working miracles and these miracles are coming to pass just like the bible has said in revelation chapter 13 if we go back there just to uh review what's going on the bible says in verse 15 and he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast of 14 and he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to that beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And so it's through the deception, the miracles, so that it's even causing fire to come down from heaven. Now, I just reminded you about the story of Elijah. And you remember during the time of Elijah, the issue was Baal worship. And when we realize there, uh, it, during the time of Baal worship, except the, the miracle was actually acted on the other side of God. So what really happened is Elijah was able to cause fire to come down from heaven. And so fire was able to come down from heaven and was able to consume the sacrifice. But then what happens here is the Baal prophets were unable to call fire from heaven. But now, in the case of apostate Protestants, they are able to actually, um, I would say, they are able to counterfeit in a way that they are, that even those who appear to be intelligent prophets Christians in the third angel's message without the word of God will be deceived. Now that is why we are told in great controversy that only those who fortify, who brace their mind in the sacred messages of God's word shall be able to stand the final conflict. The warning coming to us in the third angel's message is if any man worship the beast, but how are we going to worship the beast? we realize it's not just America forcing us to worship the beast. As a nation, with its, uh, rather, let's say, maybe the presidency and everything like that, the government, the Congress, all those things. No, I don't think that's the case. I think the case here is they're referring to a posted Protestant, a Protestant America apostatizing so that through their deception, they are able to sway millions or billions of citizens of the world to wander after the first beast up. Ah, through their miracles and through their deception, the false prophet will be working miracles that will deceive the whole world. 
and the whole world will believe miracles against a plain that says the Lord. And in believing those miracles, they will accept to receive the mark of the beast in their forehead. What that means is they will believe it with all their heart or in their hands because of persecution and because of the love of money and because they want to survive, they will be willing to surrender their religion, their faith, to be able to receive the favor of the government or the world. So it's really a trying moment for God's people. But again, I am glad to read Revelation chapter 14, verses number 9, that though we will be tried to the extent that we should be killed, there will be a death decree, God said to those who shall worship the beast, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. And what's the language that the Bible uses? In chapter 14, the Bible clearly says, and I'll go through this a little bit quickly because I can see um, I have about uh, 30 minutes. Because this says, uh, chapter 14, let's go back there. It says, the same, verse 10, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and it shall be tormented with fire and brand in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the wrath is of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of God's indignation, and it shall be tormented, that man that receives the mark of the beast, that worships the beast and his image, shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. How many beings are there, or classes of beings? We have the Father, we have the Son, and then we have all the angels that witness judgment executed upon these people. And we need to ask ourselves, what constitutes the wine of the wrath of God? Look at what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 15, verses number one. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. Okay, seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Where is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is in the seven last plagues. So, what is referred to in the third angel's message as the wine of the wrath of God is answered in chapter 15, where the Bible says, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And then you can be able to see really quickly, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast, and again, now see, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand in the sea of glass. So those people who were persecuted in chapter number 13 are now seen standing in, on the stand on the sea of glass with the lamb, with all the angels, and with the father. And then the Bible says they're having the acts of God and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, great and marvelous are the works of the Lord God Almighty, just and true are the ways of the King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art the only, or art only at only. For all nations shall come and worship thee, for thy judgments are manifest. And after that I look, and behold, the temple and the tabernacle of the testimony was opened. Now let's let's see that again. Behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts guarded with golden girdles. And then it says, and one of the four gave unto the seven angels golden vials filled with the wrath of God, who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke of God and from 
his, and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues, seven, I mean, till the plagues of the seven angels are fulfilled. Look at what happens in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Let's read from, uh, yeah, I want to read for you. Verses number six. I can begin reading from verse number five. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of the mouth and devoured the enemies. And if any man will kill, uh, and if any man will uh, hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These are power to shut up, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they did. And then he says in verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, that's the old and the new testament, the scripture finishing their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless sea shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of a great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And we know this is referring to uh, the, uh, the beast from the bottom of the spirit. It's referring to uh, uh, France itself and the revolutions in France that ended up uh, into what was called atheistic uh, French uh, nation. And then it says in verse number nine, and they of the people and kindred and times and nation shall see their dead bodies three days and, and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put to graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and many and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented uh, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Verses 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them. We saw them. So that is the uh, prophesying again after actually words of God going to the inhabitants of the earth again, despite all the attempts to bury the truth of God's word. But then it says, the second war is past, and then the Bible says, the third war cometh quickly. And then it says, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices from heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then the Bible says, and 404 elders who sat before God in their seat, and those are angels for information, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and was and is to come, because thou hast taken the, uh, uh, thou hast taken to thee the great power and hast reigned. Now look at verses number uh, 18 and 19. And the nations were angry, and, uh, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou should give the word unto the servants, thy servants, the prophets, unto the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple, in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thundering and earthquake and a great air. So you are seeing the same description there is the same description that we are seeing in chapter number 16 when it comes to the opening of the temple in heaven because it says that when the temple was opened what happened it says in verses 17 it says and the seventh angel poured out a voile into the air and came a great voice out of the temple of heaven uh, on the throne of God, saying it's done. No, uh, verse 15, chapter 15, rather. It says, and the temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And then it says, no man was able to enter into the temple in the seven plagues 
of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so what happens is in number 14, what I was referring to is that this, which is referred to as the wine, chapter 14, verses number, verses number 12, verses number 10, which refers to the same shall drink of the right of the one of God. This refers to the seven last plagues, which is poured out without mixing the cup of God's indignation, and it shall be tormented with fire. So what happens is, that's why it says, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of all the angels. So we have to see the double stroke that is coming upon the dissenters from the truth of God. They are to face the seven last plagues, but that's not enough. They are to be cast into the fires of hell. The end of this world's history. And it's important for us to be able to notice that their portion is double. Their portion is in the seven last plagues and then also in the fire. And in that alpha, the seven last plagues are not the, the, the fires of hell that consume the sinners, but rather the seven last plagues are God's judgment upon those people before the final judgment that brings eternal death, or what I would call uh, <clears throat> them being able to die without uh, having hope of resurrection. And so that is very important to see that that is in the third angel's message. And then the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of, in, in, of his name. And then the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Why is it the patience of the saints? Look at what the Bible says in uh, reading from the book of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, chapter 10, sorry. Chapter 10 is where I'm reading from. And I'm reading from verse number <laughs> 27. But a sudden fearful looking for judgment, fear indignation, we shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, and an only thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Then it says in the next verse, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord. Again and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Partially, whilst you were, uh, we were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and affliction. Primarily, this is referring to the Millerite, to the seventh month movement that went through an experience as a gazing stock, both of reproaches and affliction. And partly, they became. A comp a companions of them that were used to such. And this refers to them while they were being persecuted, they were being um, afflicted, they were being insulted, they were being scorned. With the passing of time in 1844, when there was actually a great disappointment. You can read that in Ellen White's application of those verses in the Great Controls. But then what happens is, it also refers to an experience of God's people. For our experience must be just the same as the experience of God's people in the experience of 1840 to 1844. It says, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Amen. Because when you look at it against the present trials that will come upon God's people, and yes, it's coming, and you look at it against the beautiful experience that we are going to have when we actually inherit the kingdom of God, 
and sit physically with Jesus Christ. And I mean, with the Father and his Christ and his angels. What a beautiful experience. It says, cast therefore not away your confidence, which is a great recompense of the world. For you have need of patience. We need the patience. So since 1844, when the third angel's message was preached, there has been patience. We have been waiting for the second coming of Christ. The pioneers are waiting for the second coming of Christ. They look forward to seeing Christ, but Christ has not come today. And that is why the third angel's message ends by saying, here is the patience of the saints. From 1844, they expected Jesus Christ to have come on 22nd October, which was falling on the 10th day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. But Christ did not come. And because they were on the platform of the truth, they remained faithful to the very end. Their faith was tested. Their patience was tested. And by the way, I'm going to read something about patience for you in a little while. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So after doing the will of God, many of those old standard bearers, they went into the soil, they slept there, believing and trusting that one day they will receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So you can see the blessed promises that come to God's people during the preaching of the third angel's message, that Christ will no longer tarry. And now look at how it comes. Now the just shall live by faith. That is where now. And then White understands this beautifully and says the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. Now, some people have thought that righteousness by faith was taught from 1888. That's a false understanding. Righteousness by faith was being repreached. The Philadelphian Adventist Church believed in righteousness by faith as the gospel in verity. And what happens is, from 1844, the just were living by faith, but if any man drew back, God's soul would have no pleasure in him, drawing back from the faith which was once delivered to the saints. But we are not now of them who shall draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. What is the importance of patience? I'm reading from James. I'm reading from the book of James, and... I'm thinking that I'm right. Yes. The Bible says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. James chapter 1, verse 3. The knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. How will they develop the patience? Their faith will be severely tried. So the third angel's message comes to God's people in a time of great trials of their faith. The trials of your faith work at patience. And then he says in verse number four, but let patience have perfect work. Patience must have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. How do we become perfect and entire wanting nothing? There must be a trial of our faith. And that is why we must come into direct conflict with the beast and his image. If you have to listen to that beautiful a uh, uh, message from the part angel. We have to be tried by the beast and his image. Verse number five says, and if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God which giveth liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. So you can be able to see clearly that our patience is to be tried. In fact, you can be able to see that, I guess, in, uh, I think it's chapter five. If I'm not wrong, that I guess so look at chapter five. And in chapter five, this is what the Bible says in verse number six, six verse seven. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, behold the husband man waited for the precious fruits of the ark, and at long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. And that's what God is waiting for when it's written in the book, Christ's Object Lesson, beautiful page 69. It says that God, Christ, is waiting with longing desire to have the character of Jesus Christ perfectly revealed in his church. What is he waiting for? Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and at long patience for it until the, it receives the early and the latter rain. 
And how is that perfection developed? The trial of our faith worketh patience. It's important to understand that that is why John now says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. It's very important. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Did you notice that colon? Because it's an explanation of those who are patient. The patience of the saints are the people who are keeping the commandments of God because the third angel's message is what led the Advent movement into the most holy place. So the third angel is what took them into the most holy place experience. So those who are the patience of waiting, who did not give up, who looked not by sight but by faith and stayed firm on God's word, not deceived by miracles, not deceived by spiritualism, not any of these things, they are they who are able to keep the commandments of God. And they are the same people who will keep the commandments of God. And they're the same people who accepted the faith of Jesus Christ. Why? For they accepted no other righteousness but that which is of Christ. Because their righteousness was only by filthy rags. And so in looking at the third angel's message uh, uh, this way, uh, I find it a little bit simple and understandable. Let me just read for you something from a few scripts from the spiritual prophets, if I may find time too, in the few moments I left. But this is what it said in the beautiful book, uh, 4SP, as I was going through, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4. And we'll be reading that and then just, just closing uh, our remarks in there. Spiritual Gifts, so that we can connect a few things. Spiritual Gifts, um, Volume 4. And uh, we are going to read uh, this beautiful chapter, <clears throat> the third angel's message. And I want to read for us what she says. When Christ had entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of the atonement, he committed to his servants the last message of mercy to be given to the world. What is the third angel's message? It's the last message of mercy to be given to the world. Such is the warning of the third angel of Revelation 14. Immediately following the proclamation, the son of man is seen by the prophet coming in glory to reap the harvest of earth. And so after the proclamation of the third angel, there is no other message to be preached. It's the last warning. Someone says no. But there's the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 18. Now I'll tell you one thing. The third angel's message swells into the loud cry. There is no new message to be preached, except that the angel of Revelation 14 mentions additional sins of Babylon. It is actually the loud cry because it's the third angel that swells into a loud cry. Why? Because the third angel is a warning, but at the same time it has the gospel in it. The heart of it is the gospel because you cannot preach it without preaching the first angel's message. And then now it says, as foretold in the scriptures, the ministration of Christ in the most holy place began at the termination of the prophetic time, days in 1844. And then we were able to see the temple open. The Ark of God and uh, Testament is the Ark of God's Testament is seen in the second apartment. But now I want to see something down here, which is uh, pretty interesting for me. Good. This is what I wanted us to read now. Let's read here. In the book of Revelation, under the symbol of the great red dragon, the leopard like beast, and the beast with the lamb like horns, three of them the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. And you can be able to see there is a connection between Revelation 12 and 13. And then he says, are brought to view those, uh, are brought to view those earthly governments which are especially engaged in trampling upon the law and persecuting of his people. So pagan Rome persecuted God's people. Papal Rome persecuted God's people 1,260 years. What about the false prophet? Protestant America shall persecute God's people. And then it says, their war is carried forward to the close of time. The people of God, symbolized by a holy woman and her children, are greatly in my, the minority. <clears throat> in the last days, only a remnant exists. 
So when you look at Revelation chapter 12, and someone asked me this question last Sabbath, in Revelation chapter 12, it is not the woman, it's not the seed, it's a remnant of a seed. And you need to understand that. It's the remnant of a seed where it says in the last days only a remnant of the woman and the seed exists. And it says John speaks of them as those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, through the great powers controlled by paganism and purposes, symbolized by the dragon and the leopard beast, Satan for many centuries they saw God's faithful witness under the dominion of Rome. They were tortured and slain for more than a thousand years, but the papacy was at last the primary strength and forced to desist from that persecution. At the time, at that time, the prophet beheld a new power coming up, represented by a beast with lamb-like horns. The appearance of this beast and the manner of its rise seems to indicate that the power which it represents is on those brought to view under the preceding symbols. And then it's able to say, here is a striking figure of the rise and growth of our nation and the lamb-like ones, emblems of innocence and gentleness, well represents the character of our government as is expressed in the fundamental principles, republicanism and protestantism. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought an asylum from the royal oppression and priestly intolerances, and they determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. These principles are the secrets of our power and prosperity as a nation. Millions from other lands have sought our shores in the United States as reason to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. But the stern tracing of the prophetic pencil reveals a change in this peaceful scene. The beast with the lamb like on speaks the voice of a dragon and exercises all the power of the first beast. Um, first beast of the first beast before him. The spirit of persecution manifested by paganism and papacy is again revealed. Prophecy declares that this power will say to them that dwell on the earth and they that, that they should make an image to the beast. It's a declaration. The image is made to the first or the leopard beast, which is the one brought to view in the third angel's message. And I praise God for that. So you'll never understand the third angel's message without understanding Revelation chapter number 14, 13. By this, this first beast is represented the Roman church. Listen carefully. An ecclesiastical body clothed with civil power, having authority to punish all dissenters. The image to the beast represents another, not just government, religious body, clothed with the similar power. The formation of this image is the work of that beast whose peaceful rise and mild profession rendered it so striking a symbol of the United States. Here is to be found an image of papacy. When the churches of our land, Protestant churches, uniting upon such doctrines of faith as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then will Protestant America have formed the image or an image of the Roman hierarchy. Then the true church will be assailed by persecution as were God's ancient people. Almost every century furnishes examples of what bigotry and malice can do under plea of serving God by protecting the rights of a church and state. Protestant churches that have followed the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. In the 17th century, thousands of nonconformist ministers suffered under the rule of the Church of England. Persecution always follows religious favoritism on the part of secular government. And so that's what we can see is happening. And that's why elsewhere, 
he says that the test for God's people is not the mark of the beast, but rather the image of the beast. The test that will come upon God's people is not the mark of the beast. It's the image of the beast. God's people are to be tested by that image. And we are living in the time of the sounding of the third angel's message. We need to realize that the two kin or kindred teachings of papacy of the beast is spiritualism and Sunday sacredness. And we ought to understand that Sunday is a day for worshiping a false god. And we ought to understand that the false prophet clearly directs people away from a true God. Among the other truths, as directing people from the commandments of God, directing people to depend on fantasies that come to them, or dreams that come to them, or uh, false illusions that come to them while they sleep, of their dead relatives speaking to them. Among us, those falsehoods such as infant baptism, baptizing of children, falsehoods such as transubstantiation, changing of the bread into a real body of Christ, falsehoods such as the pagan holidays and so on, mention them, the worship of the Virgin Mary, and all these things, original sin, ideas such as God does not kill, all these things, are actually having their roots out of papacy. And that all that Protestants have been doing for age is to perfectly form an image to papacy, both in its constitution, its formation constitution, in that it wants to look just like the papacy. Even though situated in America, which is also the center from which this decree will be enforced, and which we also know will be the center from which God's messages for the end time will be aggressively proclaimed. We shall see inroads of those doctrines into various countries and lands covering the whole world. The reason for that reason, the Bible says the whole world will run after this. The politics of America is something that the whole world is interested in. Christians who have studied prophecy, as well as those who have never studied prophecy. Everyone has been keen to follow who will be the next president of America, every election. And that is because America is a prophetic nation. And everyone is concerned about the state of religion in America. And that reminds us of Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter the third angel's message is the most solemn one. If any man worship the beast and his image, if any man accepts the doctrines of the beast through the deception that is brought in by apostate Protestantism, mark my words, the apostate Protestantism is the arm, the right arm that the papacy will use to get it back to its feet. Apostate Protestantism will rush and call for the help of the government. And where is it? In the United States of America. Because that is the birth of a post Protestants. They are the ones who will call the help of the government. The very people who actually descended from the wrong teachings of papacy will be the very people who will go to the government of their land and ask them for power that it, their doctrines might be enforced, which is not their doctrines, but the doctrines of the first beast, such as Sunday sacredness, talking to the dead, that is immortality of the soul, subjects such as children baptism, all these things. And just like we had seen in the second angel's message, the call was come out of our mind. And what was the what was the people? What, what were people being called out of? Those people in the second angel's message were primarily being called out of apostate protestants. We have to let people know that while papacy has been long fallen and is the woman of Revelation 14, the apostate protestants stand as the Babylon referred to in Revelation chapter 12. And they're the ones that will cause the people to reject the true God. 
of the first angel's message. They will cause thousands of people in the world to accept miracles in place of a plan that says the world. They'll cause millions of people in this world to accept spurious doctrines and worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. They are the ones who shall give life to the beast. Let us not be deceived, brothers and sisters, that purpose is working on the background and that finally it will come to life through the instrument of a positive person. May the Lord bless us as we continue to study the messages of Revelation chapter 14. And I might end by saying, here is the patience of the saints. They are the day that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you to be among the beautiful group that will be patient in his word to the very end. May God bless you. Let's pray as we end. Thank you, Father in heaven, for beautiful blessings in your heart. Save us, Lord, from the deceptions of Satan. Help us to understand what it is that you're saying to us. And Lord, help us to be saved from the wrath that is coming. It's our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.